Ni hao. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, it's very good to see you all, all, all still here. Um, we've had an amazing day so far, and we've, we've had an amazing day so far, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm excited about this next panel we have going on. So several folks have, uh, have started by, by thanking London Business School for putting together um, the, this uh, first ever China Business Forum here, here at the school. As a member of the faculty at London Business School, I have a, a, a secret I wanted to point out here. Uh, and that is, this is, while we're very proud to take credit for the China Business Forum, the reality is everything you see here, from the organization to all of the logistics here, everything and the, and the envisioning was all done by our students, uh, the members of the China Club. And uh, those of us who teach uh, in our programs uh, have all sorts of assignments. Uh, the, the term is still going on. They're in, our students are in classes. They're taking uh, exams. They're doing assignments. And on top of a very busy period, they have put together countless hours. They've spent countless hours to put together this amazing event. So what I'd like to do to start with is to thank the, the sources of energy for this, the sources of vision for this, the members of the China Business Forum, our students. So I'd love to visit you. Those of us on the faculty basically uh, just mostly just show up, uh, show up here, except that we so much more uh, evolved. We just show up here and do our little thing. Well, with that said, I, uh, I'm particularly delighted now to be to, ho to host this because, but throughout this day, uh, for much of the discussion has been around su uh, the supply side of business. So about companies. Uh, about what companies do, about investments they make, uh, about other companies they buy, marriages, love, uh, lovers, all kinds of uh, things, but from the point of view of the company. <coughs> this next panel uh, will have a particular emphasis on the customer and the consumer. And this image we see uh, here uh, of the Great Wall is perhaps a, a useful one to keep in mind. Of course, the Great Wall uh, represents uh, some of the technological innovation and the incredible history of China. The Great Wall also represents um, within China versus outside China. And there are gates within the Great Wall uh, that uh, let people in uh, and keep, people, uh, keep others out. Uh, uh, there are old parts of the Great Wall that are easier to climb over. And there are new parts uh, of the Great Wall that are harder and more impressive uh, to climb over. Uh, and, and that is actually some of the, uh, some that represents some of the perspectives we'll see in the next uh, set of panelists. And, and our panelists uh, today represent both Western companies entering the Chinese market and are trying to understand and respond to demands in the Chinese market, as well as Chinese companies looking at Western markets, especially European markets, uh, and look, uh, trying to understand demand uh, customers and, and patterns and trends in European markets. And uh, we'll, we, have, we have a very distinguished uh, set of panelists. Uh, you'll find the bios of our panelists in the brochure. So in the interest of time, uh, because otherwise we could be here spending a long time describing the impressive accomplishments of our, bio, uh, of our panelists. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to just uh, introduce each of our panelists by, by just describing their names uh, and give you an overview. Um, and, and then uh, we'll have a very lively discussion. What the panelists have suggested uh, and have agreed to is that uh, we will have a very interactive discussion. And there might be some interruptions. And sometimes I might interrupt. And we'll, 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 we'll actually have a, a very uh, sort of conversational tone to this panel. Our first uh, uh, panelist and speaker uh, is uh, Sean Gilbertson uh, from the Fabergé Company, a very famous, uh, historically uh, very impressive company uh, in uh, worldwide, uh, especially with European uh, origins. Uh, 
and, and his experiences uh, and their experiences in the Chinese market. So let me first welcome Sean Gilbertson from Fabergé. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. We're about to do, together, you and I, a magic trick. Because we are going to cover a 170-year story in 10 minutes in two languages, once by me and once courtesy of the translators at the back. By way of introduction, before the panel discussion, I wanted to give you a brief history of Fabergé, one of the most remarkable business, marketing, and branding stories in the history of humankind. Fabergé goes back to the 17th century when the Fabergé family escaped persecutionary France. And a gentleman called Gustave Fabergé established the firm in St. Petersburg in Russia in 1842. It was only in the early 20th century that Fabergé won great acclaim by competing at the World Exhibition in Paris. And during this period, Fabergé made a remarkable number of pieces. They made more than 250,000 items using 38 heads of workshops called workmasters, and they built an amazing international business with stores in Odessa, and they stretched as far as London in the United Kingdom at the address of 172 Bond Street, where Chanel is today. Of the 250,000 plus items, only 50 were the very famous Imperial Fabergé eggs that most people are familiar with. But then things changed. The Bolshevik Revolution brought Fabergé to an end, and Karl Fabergé escaped Russia and died in Switzerland in 1920. Two of his sons tried to continue the business out of Paris, but they were not particularly successful. And in 1945, they discovered that a gentleman in America had started using without permission, the Fabergé name on fragrance. And so in 1945, before Twitter and Facebook and fax machines and mobile phones, they decided to sue the gentleman, Mr. Rubin, in the United States. After six years of litigation, the family were bankrupt and they had forced on them a legal settlement whereby they ceded the rights to the Fabergé name to the American gentleman for $25,000. And that's how the family and the name got separated in 1951. Mr. Rubin, having spent $25,000 getting the name, in 1964 sold the company to a Mr. Barry for $25 million. Not a bad rate of return. And Mr. Barry was the creator of a particular fragrance called Brut and hence Brut by Fabergé, which some of you will remember, was born. Mr. Barry also made a movie called The Touch of Class, starring Glenda Jackson, and that was made under the name The Fabergé Film Production, Inc. firm. Thereafter, Mr. Rubin sold the business to a gentleman called Mr. Meshulam Ricklis, and Mr. Ricklis, in 1989, sold Fabergé, Inc., to Unilever for 1.55 billion US dollars. And at that point, Fabergé was making cosmetics, fragrances, and it also owned things like Elizabeth Arden. And they then embarked on a program of licensing. They were not particularly good years for Fabergé because it went from this to this. We had two and a half thousand limited edition Fabergé Barbie dolls made by Mattel, the toy company, under official license. 
We had the splendor in the garden Fabergé egg, yours for only $29.95, manufactured by the Franklin Mint. We had Fabergé Organics shampoo and a variety of interestingly named fragrances from Babe through Tigresse. But fortunately, our story today is about the reunification of the Fabergé name and the descendants of Fabergé in 2007 and what ensued since. But we had many problems because we had to overcome all of the licenses which, which had been issued and they were manufacturing neckties, spectacles, glassware, the infamous Brute, and there were about 400 stores selling Fabergé globally. And we worked very hard for two years to bring an end to those licenses. Hence the very big cross, because we stopped making all of the, uh, those particular products. And after two years of work, on the very auspicious nine minutes past nine, Greenwich time, on the 9th of September, 2009, that was when the reunified Fabergé was relaunched at Goodwood House in England. And I'm not going to take you through, due to the time constraints, what we've done subsequently, but we have established new stores in Geneva, in London, and also in New York. And we also operate directly with our own people and our own inventory, concessions at the world famous Harrods, and also at the IFC in Lane Crawford in Hong Kong. We also sell via our global website. The website is unusual in that we sell items ranging from $5,000 through $30,000, which is a very high price point for online sales. These will give you a quick idea of some of the items that we manufacture today. And of course, we're rapidly becoming the number one choice, sported here by a variety of leading ladies. And we are gradually getting a toe into the Chinese market. So here, for example, you will see the reunified Fabergé appearing alongside the very best in the business, in this case, in the Harper's Bazaar from China, and in this case, in Noblesse China in June of 2012. There are strong historic links between Fabergé and China. In 1910, Tsar Nicholas II presented the then emperor with this pratina, exquisitely carved, with the ancient warrior attached to the front. And similarly, it was the natural gift in the Chinese culture, and Tsar Nicholas II ordered many such items, both for the leading persons in China at that time, but also to give in the home market in Russia to the then serving Chinese ambassador. So in summary, whilst we have come a long way, we will cover in the panel discussion some of our experiences in China and the very key challenges that we face as we approach the next step of re-establishing in the future the strong ties between Fabergé and China of the past. And with that, in under 10 minutes, I thank you for your attention. and impressive feat uh, to cover all of that time in such a short period. I think I'm messing up something here, okay. Uh, our next speaker um, is from a, a Chinese company uh, and operating in Europe, uh, and uh, our speaker is Patrick Bailey, who will be sharing with us uh, their experiences uh, at Hire, um, learning about Europe and, and, uh, and their approach to branding and, and consumers. So Patrick, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Chen, for your presentation. That it's very hard for me because you make a dream. You, you show dream uh, uh, with the old, uh, the, the, this uh, very famous assistant. So now for me, it's a big, uh, big challenge. Anyway, um, have, uh, I'm a little bit lucky uh, this afternoon because a lot of uh, brilliant panelists uh, today already talk about, about higher company. So uh, I think I can uh, skip a little bit the group presentation to focus more on uh, uh, branding uh, experience uh, for higher in Western Europe and then of course to 
uh, let uh, maximum time for our uh, panel discussion. So higher thanks to our CEO, Chang Rimin. Uh, is uh, listed among the, the most famous uh, manufacturer about uh, home appliances products. Uh, talking about, of course, washing machine, uh, dishwasher, refrigerator. Mainly, our core business is the cooling. And uh, we started, uh, the company is uh, 20, 28 years old. Uh, at the very beginning, our CEO went to Germany to uh, start uh, refrigerator production under Lieberherr li uh, license, licensing. Uh, of course, now we are uh, developing the product by ourselves. So the company today is um, about uh, 20, 26 billion uh, US dollar uh, turnover, 70,000 employees, and uh, we are this is 20% of our sales is um, overseas, uh, and um, we are in 165 countries, as you can see on this map. So the, the company uh, didn't uh, reach yet the globalization stage, as we already talked before uh, during a former presentation, but we are close to this globalization. Uh, the strategy is really a, uh, let's say, a global global strategy. Uh, let's say, think global and act local. I, wi I will explain a little bit later. So the the, the main uh, strategy, our strategy, is based on uh, on uh, we can say six di di different dimensions. Of course, product range. Product range now not only customize from China side to be sold in Western Europe. It was through, let's say, 10 years, 12 years ago. Uh, when I joined the company, in fact, we were just imported products uh, as they were sold in China. Uh, maybe we changed just the color, but anyway, we didn't uh, make so many differentiation. Today, uh, in France, we in uh, w Western Europe, we have two R&D centers, one in Germany, one in France, in order to develop the product by ourselves and uh, to be able to fit much better with the uh, local Western European uh, uh, request. With this strategy, of course, we are able to have a very good coverage uh, of the market segment. Geographic development, we are doing this uh, geographic development through uh, branches, uh, meaning that we have one European headquarters located in Italy, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, mother company, uh, surrounding this mother company, we have branches in Italy, Germany, UK, uh, Spain, France, Poland. Uh, the industrial platforms, uh, now are, let's say, uh, more and more European uh, industrial platform. R&D, I talked uh, already. HR empowerment philosophy is one of the key, uh, let's say, of our strategy uh, for uh, Western Europe development. Uh, maybe we will talk a little bit uh, more in detail during the, 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 the panel. No way without quality, for sure. No way uh, to succeed in, in Europe without design. Uh, innovation, uh, of course, based on uh, R&D uh, investment. We, uh, higher is investing 4% of his uh, total turnover in, in R&D. And uh, this morning, Mr. Wong talked about uh, emulation before innovation. I, I like so much this, uh, this thinking because, in fact, emulation for uh, it's very a uh, good first stage uh, of uh, uh, employee commitment uh, in in the uh, in this approach of innovative uh, development very in very interesting so patent uh, of course uh, many patents uh, are coming from our our development so two r d centers the on the right one uh, i just launched this new r d centers uh, six months ago in lyon in France, this R&D center is uh, uh, mainly dedicated to uh, uh, renewable products such as uh, uh, thermal, uh, solar thermal, heat pump, uh, all the product uh, um, energy efficiency oriented. And Nuremberg uh, in Germany is uh, dedicated to our Y Goods product, 
uh, M&E Laundry Development. I will explain also during the panel why uh, we need this R&D center located in, in, in Europe. Europe is really a nightmare for Chinese people, really. I will explain why. <laughs> so, of course, you understood which kind of products we are selling. Our location in Europe, I talk about social media, and I, th I see that uh, my time is uh, already over, so. Um, <laughs> in fact, the, the main two, two ways uh, to, uh, to succeed in, uh, in Western Europe for a Chinese brand, the first one is uh, talent, t meaning team talent, people. Uh, this is uh, really the first. Uh, in the talent, we can talk about uh, competencies, uh, skill, of course, talking about the, 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 the profession, but talent also uh, to, uh, to meet the Chinese culture, uh, meaning that a, a talent European guy to work for a Chinese company is a guy able to understand the culture, to, to, to be interested by the culture, and then to be able to build, let's say, an in-between culture, uh, in between his own culture, could be UK one, French one, and the, and the Chinese one. And then on this in-between culture, we can make a very good business. If the guy stay in his own side, meaning that it could be more or less arrogant, even if he's a talent guy, he will never succeed. This is one of the key I would like to emphasize today, talking about the, um, the, the way to, to make a business for a Chinese company. Uh, to talking about social media features, of course, uh, we are uh, coming from e-commerce a uh, few years ago, uh, meaning that uh, in between the brand and the end user was the distributors, and so we were not in a direct link with the end user. Now we are, uh, thanks to social media uh, such as Facebook, in the direct contact with end users, so able to interact with him, able to uh, understand much better um, and, and then to also uh, increase our brand awareness. One of the key uh, to succeed with a, in, a, in a social media is to have, let's say, a very clear target, cust end user target, which, which end user is your brand end user. Uh, for higher, we are, as, as we can see here, we are much more focused on, uh, let's say, trendsetter end user, and for sure your communication, your way to talk, uh, to, to end user across the social media support will be according to your target, uh, uh, end user target. I will talk later about that. Ah, I would like just to introduce you Easy. Good, mo good, good afternoon, Easy. Easy is our uh, mascot. Uh, a very nice way also to create, let's say, a very uh, uh, funny not funny, but uh, familiar linked with the end user. Uh, so this is uh, our easy mascot. Alors, social media is one key, of course, it is, this is not the only one. Uh, advertising is very important. Let's say the traditional uh, uh, advertising and promotion support must be considered in your strategy, in addition to media, social media strategy. Uh, the, the past one are still uh, must be considered. You not you, we, we never you don't have to cut the the what the way how we advertise uh, the brand uh, by the past because of the new uh, social uh, uh, social uh, network. Here, this is just a quick example about digital marketing. So it seems, uh, let's say, a very uh, a very tough uh, slide. But in fact, this is the way to talk on a digital marketing. Uh, to talk the way to, to talk about social network, it's this way. I mean, because you have so many, even the target and user target is, is clear. The way to talk with each of them inside this target is a different way. So you have to use really uh, uh, even, even a different language. Uh, uh, we have also, uh, let's say, a public uh, website uh, in which one you can find the virtual showroom. Okay, here I will uh, finish with that. This is our uh, achievement on uh, Facebook. We are mainly Facebook oriented. Movies, I, I, um, uh, you can go to uh, YouTube to see uh, all the very short movies 
uh, we, uh, we, we built to talk with our uh, consumers. Each event on the calendar, such as Valentine Days, Christmas campaigns, and so on, is uh, the opportunity to talk uh, with a, a specific language. All the movies on YouTube. Here, this is easy uh, as a James Bond uh, position. Of course, you have to optimize the way to find the higher name on the, on the website very easily. Bloggers, it's a, 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 let's say a community on the uh, on internet. You have also to, uh, to capt, you have to, to, to get their interest because these bloggers, uh, allow this is, yes, there is a risk yeah, to talk with bloggers because they can, they can uh, share uh, uh, good or bad information regarding your brands. So it's also kind an investment. Bloggers' investment is very important. You have to find, let's say, the, the key bloggers in your countries. And uh, here, this is just an, uh, an example of uh, our uh, results. So actually, Hire uh, has 255,000 fans on Facebooks, uh, fe fe Facebook, sorry. And we can compare with directly with our competitors, such as Bosch, who, who is actually listed uh, in 60,000. We are pool IG CMN. So uh, it's a, at European level, uh, two, two person totally dedicated to this uh, social media activity, uh, supported by one agency, agency. In this agency, there is one uh, person uh, on a daily basis available to, uh, to input uh, information, also to feedback to end user, request, claim, and so on. But it's not so. It's not a so 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 big uh, uh, investment. So just to finish, uh, conclusion: uh, a brand even higher with the Chinese brand with the Chinese name. Uh, we are lucky also with the name pronunciation in Europe because higher pronunciation is Europe is much more German sound than Chinese sound. So this is also. A big chance uh, for us, for sure. But just to finish, I want to say that uh, for sure, social media uh, today in Western Europe is mandatory uh, to build uh, the brand awareness uh, uh, strategy. Shesheni. <laughs> If I could uh, request the other members of the panel uh, to join us here, please. Uh, um, so Sean uh, and, and Su Xu Xiao, um, Professor Sun, and uh, Lu Ting, please. Please. Um, okay, she get up. Do you have a? Okay. Then I think we are gentlemen, ladies, gentlemen, ladies, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sean, do you have a headset for yourself? Then I'll, I might just take that one. Is that? Does everyone? Very good. Well, thank you very much, both uh, gentlemen. Now, uh, before we uh, go into the more interactive uh, parts, I thought it would be uh, useful to uh, get some perspectives from um, each of our other panelists. Um, if I could start with uh, Xu Xiao. Uh, you heard the incredible close to 200 year history um, of uh, Fabergé and all of the different parts of the world they've uh, operated in as well as all of the different uh, country uh, companies that have owned them. Um, now, of course, your history is a, is a story of, uh, of modern China um, rather than uh, royalty. Your history is one of uh, the internet and new technologies and entering a very similar market uh, in China using the power of the internet uh, in a very short period of time. You've come a long way. Can you give us a quick uh, description uh, of your experiences uh, as a founder and, and, and CEO uh, of Zbird. Thank you, 
Uh, moderator, I'm very honored to come to meet all of you. Um, you know, this morning, especially this afternoon, we talked to you know, quite a lot about marriage, and now we're talking about diamonds. That's very interesting. And uh, now I can see that, uh, you know, Fabergé is 200 years history, and our company, our brand history is only about 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, my brother and I went online, and uh, we um, created um, this, um, um, you know, brand, and uh, the word Z bird is actually a combination of the two of us. Now, Z is his name, and bird is me. Um, now, um, you know, diamond is a historical, um, you know, representation, and bird is like the internet, and is changing from day to day. So make things very easy, make communication very easy. Um, so when we saw the 200 years brand, they went online, and um, um, we really admire them. Um, however, from the Chinese point of view, as a jewelry brand, how should we actually become? Uh, how do we how do we compete with a brand that's got over 100, 200 years history? Should we really understand our customers' need? Should we have a long-term strategy? Uh, would that actually help us to develop not only 10 years but 100 years? So we're actually in a very interesting junction at the moment. In the past 10 years, um, lots of lots of things have changed. Now, 10 years ago. Uh, when you go online in China, when you when you went online in China, very few people actually bought things, um, you know, online. And certainly, there were very few people um, were willing to buy, you know, diamonds online. I think there were fewer than ten people. However, in these days, I would say that uh, there's over over. Um, over two billion people in China have bought diamonds online, and there are more people who are interested. These are the people who have bought them, but there are more people who are actually interested. So therefore, people's life is so um, interlinked with, um, you know, internet. You can buy absolutely anything. For example, um, in one day, um, online. More than 100, more than 100, um, you know, smart car was sold in just one day, and that's amazing. So lots of people were willing to try new things. Actually, 10 years ago, it was very difficult actually to sell, you know, diamonds online. The first you know, diamond sale took us three months, but nowadays it's very different. Things developed really, really quickly. So we want more friends and more customers to. Have have better understanding of us through online business. So internet is something not only people who are familiar with, but it's something they cannot live without. Um, so modern world become more internet linked. Another aspect is we keep on talking about post 70, post 80, post 90, because in China, every 10 years is like a generation change. Um, it's, it's actually a very important um, marking point. There's a very famous research company um, actually did some research among Chinese consumers. The result was really interesting. Um, post 70, friends and family are the two key words. After 80, the key word is self, and after 90, is only self. So therefore, that's actually quite an interesting concept because um, the groups, people are involving, evolving. We just got used to post 70, and now we have to get used to, um, you know, post 80 and post 90, including our staff. Most of our staff are post 80. So therefore, for a jewelry brand, the most important thing is you have to understand what your consumer want. Different generation, they want different things. And what what are they interested? What are they? Uh, all sorts of things. For example, post ninety, post eighty, they're not like their parents' generations because their parents don't really aren't very keen on you know expressing themselves. But nowadays, young people they love expressing themselves and they would like to choose very individual brand to express themselves. So therefore, that's the difference. 
So post 90, for us, this brand is post 90. We need to have our individuality. Um, we need to. It's almost like uh, um, you know people in love. You need to express um, what you're good at, and you need. And uh, when you talk to the consumers, it's like we're talking to friends. You need to show them. Um, the human side of yourself. You don't want to be higher up because uh, you don't want people to think they just look up to it. And now you want to be shoulder to shoulder. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, useful and, and uh, concise uh, summary. And I took away two things. One is the challenge of selling something as um, as unique as diamonds on, online. Right? So it's one thing to buy books or, um, online. Well, you kind of know what to expect. Uh, diamonds seem so unique that in order for someone to buy uh, diamonds online, they'd really have to trust a brand. You also mentioned the changes across generations in China. Uh, can you combine the two? What are the trends you are seeing? Um, a, in uh, consumer trust in brands and what you can do to build trust in your own brand. Um, and, uh, and, and B, how is that different among the older versus newer uh, generation? People, when it comes to establish the trust, uh, mainly through the uh, if he or she agree with you, and that is different from the elder generation and more focused on um, reliable. In China, when it comes to diamond, uh, they, they, they have a concept, say, I have to buy some, something truly gold. Nike carrot gold is very welcome in Europe, but in China, uh, it's very difficult. It's not that popular at all. They normally like, uh, like uh, uh, the gold is like 24 carat uh, gold, it is 99.9% 9 .9 of gold. So, because because young people the individuality it, it, it's crucial to them. They want what they represent. They don't really care about the content. They don't really care about. Uh, so they put themselves first. That that is to say, the young people. Um, of, of course, diamond, you need to have a certified. Uh, secondly, it's individual personalized design. Uh, and then once you establish that, then, then, then the young generation will should trust you more. I mean, uh, okay. Different ways um, to the elder generation. Very good. Um, anything you want to add, uh, Sean, on, on Sean trust? Um, and how you get um, testing, testing. Is that coming through at all? It is. Thank you very much. Um, your point about trust, I thought, was an interesting one, especially when you have to compare the perceived advantage that we have of a 200-year-old name <laughs> with yours, which is much fresher. And it's interesting that uh, a couple of years ago, we ran an exhibit of some of our higher-level pieces in China. And very often when you take the, the high value pieces, and I'm talking you know, from $200,000 through one or $2 million into China, we take them in under a special passport arrangement, which does not allow them to be sold in the country hmm. unless they first leave the country and then come back into China. And that was fine for us because it was just an exhibit. But we put these pieces on display and one absolutely charming Chinese lady fell in love with one of the pieces. And she said, I would like to buy that piece right now. And we tried to explain that, Madam, we're terribly sorry, but we can't sell it to you today. We could sell it to you, but the piece will have to travel back to Europe, go through the customs and import and export arrangements, and then be returned to you. And she would not trust a brand with even 200 years of history <laughs> because she was convinced that we would send her a fake. Mm. 
Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, I want to turn next uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Lu Xiying. Uh, now, we heard earlier uh, from, from Chairman Rong about the, the history of your company, and particularly the linkage, linkages between the company and Tsinghua University. <clears throat> now, you're involved with branding uh, for this very diverse uh, company with a strong engineering and science and technology focus. Uh, can you talk a bit about the challenges and rewards of branding in a company like yours? I'm very happy to share the Tongfang brand uh, with everybody here to talk about our development. This morning, Mr. Rung has um, you know, introduced to you a lot about Tongfang. Tongfang is actually a young person, it's only, got, it's, it's only 15 years. And when Tongfang um, was actually formed, um, when Tongfang was formed, Tongfang was very young. Tongfang didn't actually look um, to do a lot of work in terms of brand. I started um, um, worked in you know, 2006. Mr. Rong said to me, let's look into Tongfang's brand. We spent about three years um, to. When I took it over, uh, Tongfang was actually was um, 7.1 renminbi. Um, three years ago, uh, three years later, it's turned into 50 years. In, um, it's turned to you know, 50 billion. So therefore, within three years, we actually increased 40 billion renminbi in terms of the you know, brand. So let's talk about the um, Tongfang, Tsinghua Tongfang. So what do people think, these four words, science and achievement? Uh, science and trust. These two are the most most important words for our brand. Um, I'd like to share a small story with us. In 1907, that's 105 years ago, my grandfather uh, went to Japan to study. At the time, um, he got number one. Um, he actually managed to get into the Tokyo University, Tong uh, um, I mean the Tokyo University, and he also managed to get into another university. Now, the, but eventually he chose to go to the Tokyo University. When he died, he was 96 years old. After I joined, um, you know, Tongfang, um, a few years later, I went to Shanghai uh, to pay my respect to his grave. When I was um, cleaning um, his, um, um, you know, tombstone, and I saw the back of his tombstone, um, it's got four words, which is innovation and trust. So really, what he was saying was very similar to what we're actually promoting now. Um, so you're living your grandfather's Sweet. story. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I do want to pick up on, uh, on related themes uh, um, um, about studies, uh, about uh, studying overseas, uh, uh, as your grandfather did, uh, and ideas from within China, which has a very long history uh, of innovation, technology, and so on. Um, as well as from outside, which we're seeing uh, throughout. And uh, actually, uh, I want to turn to Professor Sun on that as, as dean of a, uh, of a business school. Um, the word talent was used uh, many times, and uh, many people mentioned the importance of, of talent. Um, in Patrick's case, uh, talent in Europe uh, and being able to manage uh, within the culture of a, of a Chinese company uh, with a particular history uh, and, um, and a, a European market with a particular set of expectations. What have been your experiences in terms of talent um, and, uh, and uh, what, what do you think are the trends there? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities? <laughs> 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 
You actually gave me another different question. Initially, we were talking about brand. You are asking me a different question, and now you want me to talk from the talent's point of view. Um, but of course, that's actually part of our core ideas. Uh, when we develop a brand, we're actually developing, um, you know, consumers. I've been thinking about brand. Uh, I, um, um, although I work in a Chinese university, but I'm actually into, you know, marketing, and um, in terms of marketing, so we are looking at how to develop talents in the field of um, political and law. Um, a legal science. So now if we look at the um, concept of brand and uh, we look at what consumers need, um, I think that from a he, um, theor theoretical point of view, there's lots of um, um, you know, definition of brand is actually not correct. Um, for it's, it's quite misleading, I think, some of the concepts nowadays when we're talking about um, brand nowadays. Uh, what this one statistics say China actually is most developed, uh, increased the most uh, actually in terms of consuming luxury products. It seems to me, um, uh, I was told the Chinese people enter into those luxury shops and and actually sell and uh, buy them all. Does that mean? They actually have owned uh, the majority of wealth in the world, but actually not true. Uh, the wealth per capita is only just below the average level worldwide. That is to say, the brand position is not accurate. You position, uh, you and you sort of um, group this. Brand into different categories. This is high and medium and low. My definition of brands, I think, that three elements of a brand: one's function, uh, enjoyment, and the symbol. This. So, I tend to believe every brand has three elements. Uh, Madam Lu pointed out early on in Qinghua Tongfang's brand. It, it, it's it's more reflected, much more reflected from its function, and that bird is more a sort of, of a symbol. Symbol, this element. Again, if we divide, we can divide one element into many other elements. Symbol, is not just a luxury, not just a reflection of wealth and also your individuality, your culture, and the concept reflects many things. Uh, some of the brands, it's a symbol of wealth, uh, indiv indiv um, as I say, individuality and, um, and culture. From this angle, we have to think about the three elements. We need to reposition the, the brands and to find out what the customers needs from us. So we have we can focus on the different elements and uh, we think uh, the function, the technology plays an important part. And symbol is more a kind of a person's psychology, mentality. So therefore, we have to uh, focus more on a consumer's needs and redefine the brands. For example, Zappa, only they have a mere 10 years history, but they can still fly high. So from this angle, that is my understanding uh, uh, of uh, it's a kind of my new understanding of uh, brand. Uh, we can rethink uh, brands. Thank you very much for that uh, textbook discussion of, uh, of brands. And I might come back to you on that skills question uh, a little later then. Uh, let me actually go back to, to, to Patrick. And uh, um, you brought up the skills question. But before we get to the uh, skills question, 
If you had, given your experience, you were involved with the hire in France, and now you're looking after um, a hire uh, throughout Western Europe. Um, now, Hire has a, a long history, relatively uh, relative to other Chinese companies, in looking outside China. The experience in Africa is, it seems like, every time I go to Africa, it seems like Hire is seen as a high-end, very innovative brand that actually listens to African consumers and uh, is well-loved in Africa. In America, there's a different positioning. They seem to be doing well as well. I may be wrong on this, but the sense I get in Europe is that uh, there, have, there have been downs as well as ups. And can you give us a sense for what your experience has been in Europe and uh, positioning higher uh, within Europe and what some of the challenges have been, especially as a Chinese brand? You mentioned the links to Germany uh, or German-sounding names. But as a Chinese brand, what are the uh, challenges and opportunities? <clears throat> Yeah, good question. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge uh, we, we face uh, during the past uh, 10 years in, uh, in Europe is uh, the, um, the different culture, the different European culture for, for washing, for cooking, oh. for cooling, uh, food and clothes uh, from south and north, fr from south to, to, to north of Europe, even sometimes in one country. Like Italy, they didn't wash their, their clothes in the same, same way from south of Italy to north of Italy. So uh, comparing to China or comparing to United States, or these pays are global country. They are unified countries speaking the same language with more or less a, the same culture. Uh, even for sure, China from east to west is different. But I mean, uh, Europe is really a, a, a nightmare, uh, as I said uh, during my presentation. Why? Because of this, let's say, culture puzzle. And for a manufacturer, it's, it's really difficult to uh, optimize the, 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 the development and the production of one item uh, when you want to sell in, in Western Europe, let's say in Europe, globally speaking. Uh, again, because the product, uh, the, 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 the market request uh, from, from each country, and sometimes again in the same country from north to south, uh, are different. And uh, the, the, the solution, the first step, of course, is to have, let's say, strong marketing people. Uh, it was, let's say, seven, eight years ago in order to customize as well the product uh, produced for Chinese, for local market talking about it could be color or, or lettering uh, on a panel. Uh, so very few, of course, adjustment and, and try to succeed with that. And it's why this first stage is, is really a crucial stage. Because if you are not, if you don't enter in the market in the two first years, you are kick off that definitely. And here, the talent of your salespeople are very, really key. Oh. It means that you must have a higher um, uh, uh, sales manager with a strong network uh, in order to, to, to be able to sell even this product, uh, let's say, just customized from China. So it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Now, of course, the second step is uh, um, to, lo to localize the development, what we are doing now. And the third stage will be the production, local production, because now we are still facing lead time. Uh, for importation with, uh, let's say, uh, PSI, as we said, uh, forecast, sales forecast uh, three or four months in advance with uh, no any flexibility uh, to refuel <laughs> our stores in Western Europe. Yeah. So uh, let's say this is the normal uh, development uh, uh, stage. We are now uh, uh, developing locally. And let's say in the coming years, maybe, uh, uh, maybe not so, so long, uh, we will uh, produce uh, locally. So, uh, uh, yes, go ahead, Sean. Sure, I'm not interrupting. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, um, quickly, yes. I, I may offer you one other bit of insight based on our experience in China on the subject of the cultural differences. Mm. And it, it is obviously a fact of life in this day and age that international business has to somehow overcome the cultural differences. And one has to pay naturally great respect to it. But by definition, it is impossible to perfectly understand somebody else's culture, and the reverse is also true. And we have found that a little bit of humor and the ability to laugh at oneself when you get it wrong, as you often do, helps to break down those barriers. 
But even then, you come across experiences which you never expect. So in Beijing, uh, approximately 18 months ago, we ran an event in the Pangyu Hotel. And w this was a sales event, so we had assorted customers coming through the venue. And um, another charming Chinese lady arrived, looked at some of the pieces, tried one of them on, loved it, and said, thank you very much, I will take it, before there had been any discussion of price. <laughs> <laughs> And she then proceeded to walk straight to the door to leave the venue whilst wearing the necklace. Now, we obviously take our own security people <laughs> because you know, it's important to work with people that you know and trust and have worked with for years. And as she approached the door with the two security men standing at it, she said something in Chinese to them, which of course they didn't understand. But the tone of her voice made them separate. And she walked straight out the door and our CEO then had to follow her out of the facility <laughs> and into the elevator. And the price for the piece was negotiated in the elevator between the 20th floor and the ground floor. <laughs> and she walked out, got in the car, and drove away. Fortunately, we had a rough idea of who she was, and we knew that the payment would likely come. But it left our team standing, what just happened? Because they'd, <laughs> they'd never come across anything like that before. <laughs> Actually, uh, oh, no. oh, yes, okay. please. Yes. Uh, to me, when it comes to brand, uh, you must try to understand the consumer's mentality, the culture. Recently, I give you an example. Before we left China, they actually gave me a, a subject talking about the emerging middle class in China. How do you capture the, the consumers, middle classes consuming mentality? I actually thinking about it, which is not restricted to middle class in China. In today's society, whether it's in China, whether it's in, in our developed countries, regardless, consumers, they already changed their uh, behavior. I want to share um, uh, my will with you. One is prolific uh, service. Uh, what I mean is that you, you, you want to show your service, service your product to the Chinese people. If they get the information easily, and then the purchasing is comfortable, and then eventually you make it a, a successful deal, and then if it's the, the jury gets dirty, how do you look after and maintain it? You can tell them the whole story. Then the one-stop service, the prolific service, uh, this is you've got to be faced and dealt with by all of us. Not just the design of the car, not just uh, limited to to the design. It's you got to set up the, all the models. My second real point is that it's the uh, marketing, uh, artistic uh, marketing. Uh, and art is uh, kind of life, and life is its art. Majority of people now, uh, they are no longer living in, under the poverty. So an art in life, life in art, people would like to approach your brands. So it's a good opportunity for you to capture the consumers. In China, we have a very famous scientist uh, Qian Xueshen, his name is called Qian Xueshen. A few years ago, I read one of his books. In his books, he said, why I have achieved so much in science and technology? Uh, he, was, he was an expert in uh, nuclear. Uh, for him, it's art in science and science in art because his wife was a pianist. Uh, his wife has brought him um, uh, many good ideas. So we're talking about the source. <coughs> we're talking an original imagination. So you have the uh, you have the uh, imagination. Then you have uh, innovation. So capture the consumer and make, make your brand warm, and then uh, it will you will be successful. The brand. 
Uh, uh, and uh, I have one last uh, request before we take questions. Uh, and, and especially uh, because many of our participants here either work for or are interested in starting entrepreneurial entities or, or are working for larger corporations. Um, and I, I, I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, especially um, Ms. Xu, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, if you had to speak to a group of entrepreneurs and give them one piece of advice that you wish you had known before, what would that be? You know, what advice would you give to our students uh, and those who wish to start companies for the next generation? Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning, uh, 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 it's a shame. It's one question they, they ask. Uh, was, the question was addressed to uh, uh, President Wang. I wanted to ask uh, President Wang a question. Uh, as a rep of many entrepreneurs in China, I want to ask him. I wanted to ask him a question. I was not given the chance because we, we with hard work, the environment uh, is more difficult than you could imagine. Especially as a as a young entrepreneur, they work they really extremely hard. I think that a young life is overdraft. It's a shame. Uh, that some entrepreneur. Um, they actually they work seven days a week. They work over 12 hours a day. And then they die at a very young age. So uh, at the time, I, I wanted to ask uh, President Wang a question. What I envy him is not his business success. And also, he it, it balances his business and life. Uh, that's something I really admire. To me, the most important thing as a printer, and as uh, Madame Lu pointed out, whether you run a business or a, or, or a brand, and you've got to be passionate about your life, uh, 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 love your family, you have to be passionate about life, and uh, people around you, then that love and passion will be reflected in your business, in your brand. So for those uh, young entrepreneurs, I want to share two of my uh, experiences. The first one of all is not all the students uh, actually are capable of setting out a business once they're out of uni. They got to know more about the society, have a few years working experience, and then define their own direction before they actually get on with their own businesses. I actually I started my own business three years after I worked for somebody else. And by then, you have a, a clearer um, and direction and goal. And, also, and then after that, you have to persevere. But please do not overdraft too much physically. Um, therefore, uh, to a young entrepreneur, you have to understand ultimately what is the most important thing in life, the value of life and what is value for business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, gosh. So hard work, uh, passion, and priorities is what I, uh, what I heard from you. Thank you very much. I think we're running uh, out of time. I think we started a little uh, late, so we have about seven minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, so we'll take just a few questions uh, for, uh, on Q&A. And uh, if you could please introduce yourself and ask the question. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please do so. We're back there. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, just, uh, Hello, good afternoon. My name is Fo Lin, and uh, I'm actually working in a company here, and um, um, I invest. we actually invested in a French company. I have a question I would like to ask uh, Ms. Xiao. Um, lots of, um, you know, products were actually probably quite, f you know, quite familiar, you know, with your product. My question is, now, in terms of um, I mean, a Chinese company, um, um, for example, you have, um, you know, tenant and you also have, you know, group arm, you know, this kind of company. You actually work in the business of diamond. So therefore, there is actually quite a lot of, um, um, you know, competition. So I understand that e-commerce, actually 95% of e-commerce in China probably are not actually making any profit. Now, um, have you ever thought about 
My second question is, have you ever thought about, you know, going out of China, perhaps, you know, develop um, in other countries um, in Asia or, you know, Southeast Asia? Thank you very much for your question. I think your question is far too long. I can't even remember your first question. I think first one you were talking about the um, surviving condition for Chinese e-commerce. Uh, the Chinese e-commerce is probably is still a very early, you know, developing stage. So any you know any sector actually go through actually a difficult early period, and then gradually getting to the mature later. Point. So, in the past few years, um, many e-shops in China have developed, um, you know, quite fast, and they have attracted a lot of investment, both in China and abroad. Um, and sometimes, when you are actually, um, you know, developing your business, if you don't, if if you are not, you know, making any profit, probably it's not, a, you know, necessarily a bad thing. So, if you have a lot of investment. Um, you have too much money. You don't know what, how how to use this money. So therefore, um, you know, some companies they spend a lot of money to do advertising to try to bring in you know business to themselves. So I'm not sure this kind of um, um, this kind of um, you know development, this kind of investment input is necessarily a good thing. Um, so I think it's because you are actually too eager for growth, and you forget what is the most fundamental thing um, for your business. And I think the most fundamental issue for your business is is you know sustainability, because if your value is just a bubble, then actually sooner or later that bubble is going to break. Um, However, if your value is actually based on something else, i.e. excellent product, excellent I mean, customer service, then at that time, your company, even um, perhaps you can't actually get the investment input, and perhaps you would, you know, your development is a bit slow, um, it's actually a healthy company. So this year, I can actually see the e-shop um, you know, environment um, is actually getting a lot more stable um, after the last two years. In the past 10 years, um, there's about 100,000 e-shops were formed in China. But in the past few years, um, many, many, more than tens of thousands of e-shops actually went bankrupt. Um, so people need to think, really, what is the core value of your business? What is the um, you know, momentum for your you know, sustainability. So this year, I'm actually quite happy uh, when I go back, um, you know, to China from London, we're going to have an annual conference. This conference of e-shops, we only talk, we we're only going to talk about you know brand. So I'm actually quite happy to have one topic, i.e. brand, among e-shops in China. Um, we're actually going to talk about this topic. Now, when something is developed um, in the process of being you know developed, you're going. I mean, you know, you're bound to fall over. You're bound to make mistakes. Um, however, I think this is actually a good time. We are going to review ourselves. We are going to think about our development value. And we're going to think about our own field. So therefore, I think this is actually a good thing, which would enable us to develop, um, very, very you know, sustainably. Uh, in fact, later, right after this session, we'll have two very experts on the very on this very topic, Savio Kwan, who was instrumental in building one of the <laughs> most impressive uh, electronic retail uh, internet retailers, uh, Alibaba in China, as well as Benson Tam, who's uh, invested in some of the most successful retailers who. Uh, Knowing both of them, I'm sure we'll have a, a wonderful panel. Uh, before we go on to their panel, though, we have a few questions. Yes, the lady here. I'm from Fabergé. Um, my name is Ying. I work for Christie's, uh, the auction house. So we do sell some of your fabulous collections. Um, I think you did a fabulous job presenting the brand, but um, at some point we can see that it was completely separated from the Fabergé family, and it was put on shampoo, such other products. I was just wondering, how would you position and compete with um, other blue-blooded jeweler as Cartier or 
Harry Winston, when you enter the Chinese market, when the customer is getting you know, increasingly sophisticated? Um, excellent question. A and each one of those brands obviously have different strategies to the market. And I should start by saying that at this point in time, our entry into the market is still nascent. And we're basically trying to do it one step at a time to learn as we go along, rather than plunging in head first and potentially getting lost. Um, and I think many of you will have met uh, my associate Veronica, who's somewhere in the audience here and something of my guru on Chinese matters. But the, the question that was asked earlier on is, what's one of the key things that we would focus on in looking at the Chinese market today? I think it's one of being patient, taking your time, getting a little bit involved, getting some experience directly on the ground, but also, very importantly, looking at traveling luxury <coughs> consumers. In other words, obviously, there's a very big trend of traveling Chinese consumers who visit different markets. And I think if you, if you mm. have your feet in both of those, you are best positioned to take things forward. Mm. Interesting. Um, yes. Hi. Uh, question for Patrick. Uh, my name is Melvin Chen from Terra Firma Capital Partners. So, so uh, actually, I work for a private equity firm, and I, I've just been in China for, for six months, so experiencing some of the cultural differences that you alluded to earlier. But my, I'm really fascinated by uh, Chinese companies building global brands. If you look at you know, S&P, or if you look at Fortune 500 companies, there's 70 Fortune 500 companies uh, that are Chinese, but very few of these are you know, global brands, you know, Haya, Lenovo, Qingdao are a few. But, you know, I, I, I'm really interested to get your perspective on how you think Chinese companies, aspiring uh, Chinese companies trying to build these global brands can really, you know, work with people like you on the ground in Europe, in America, to, uh, to better build brands. And, you know, anecdotally, have you had, have you, give an account of what it's been like working with Hire in, uh, in Western Europe. Okay, so maybe I will answer twice okay. a question at the same time, because also you asked the question regarding which could be your advice regarding yeah. uh, the brand, uh, for the Chinese brand penetration, how to do what is, a, that is the best key we, co we could emphasize. Uh, for me, the best key is uh, to invest on uh, unique people uh, local people, I mean native people, uh, in each um, uh, category of, of business, such as the sales, marketing, uh, uh, logistic, uh, finance, uh, and to find these people to use, uh, if possible, a Chinese hunting company. So with this process, you are sure, first of all, that the guy is speaking, let's say, uh, quite uh, good English, fluent English, first of all. And also, a Chinese human resource company could be able to uh, challenge the guy regarding his open mind uh, for culture. Because this is, uh, I saw so many uh, good guy, or girl, or lady, failed because they were not, uh, let's say, ready to the uh, cultural uh, shock uh, Patrick, can I ask you, how do you judge something like that? Whether someone is open to culture? Um, first of all, uh, you need to, to understand uh, um, uh, wh what is uh, the interest of the person outside of the business. Uh, reading, uh, uh, museum. Uh, uh, if the person is uh, really um, open mind about art, culture, uh, it's really a good starting point to be sure that the person will be also open mind to uh, to, to succeed uh, and, and to let's say uh, by, uh, bypass but uh, to 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 unify or to to be close to the cu Chinese culture. So, so you would you would agree with uh, Madame Lu about science and art coming together for absolutely, example? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Or maybe sometimes uh, uh, martial art uh, <laughs> okay, can be uh, fighting or <laughs> yeah yeah and practice for ten years. Oh, very cool. Um, I think we're out of time, I'm afraid. So uh, uh, we could have gone on for a long time. So, and this has been an absolutely fascinating uh, topic. And, and uh, lots of questions <laughs> answered. But equally, like with any good panel, lots of questions unanswered, uh, lots of questions in our minds. And it also, a panel like this, uh, to me, 
describes why, in my own life, why a place like London Business School is such a special place. Just to see all of you here, some of you coming from such long distances to be with us, uh, uh, people from such varied backgrounds from within China, South Africa, France, uh, uh, I'm from India, all of us talking about areas of common interest. And that, to me, represents all of these cultures coming together and perhaps the new generation uh, that, uh, that you were talking about. So with, uh, let me just say thank you very much for a lively conversation uh, and, um, and thank you again to the organizers. <laughs>